Welcome to Success Story. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. The HubSpot Podcast Network has incredible podcasts like Entrepreneurs on Fire, hosted by John Lee Dumas. Entrepreneurs on Fire stokes inspiration and shares strategies to fire up your entrepreneurial journey and create the life you've always dreamed of. Listen to Entrepreneurs on Fire or Success Story wherever you listen to your podcasts. Today, my guest is Julie Winkle Giuliani. She is a two times best selling author, she is a TEDx speaker, and she is a champion of workplace professional growth and development. Uh, she is a co author of the international bestseller, Help Them Grow or Watch Them Go. That was translated into seven languages. And she is the author of the soon to be international bestseller, Promotions Are So Yesterday. In addition to writing and speaking on workplace and development issues, she leads the firm Design Arounds. They create trainings to organizations worldwide. Uh, they have earned praise and awards from Human Resource Executive Magazine's top 10 training products, the New York Film Festival, Brandon Hall, and Global HR Excellence Council. She has built uh, her entire career about how helping people level up in their own careers. So we spoke about her origin story, her pivoting from teaching to uh, creating global corporate training programs to what she speaks about and evangelizes now, how people can help their employees level up, how we can create better frameworks for uh, professional development and workplace development. Uh, we spoke about her actual framework. She has a seven alternative dimension of development framework. So not financially driven, not uh, job title or promotion driven. She focuses on contribution, competence, confidence, connection, challenge, contentment, and choice. And how as a manager or a leader or a CEO to actually upskill your team with these seven dimensions. We spoke about why promotions are so yesterday, why alternative career development is so important. We spoke about what career development looks like today, the reality of the job market, what people are looking for, why they're staying with companies, why they're leaving. Um, we spoke about what it means to career climb today. We spoke about uh, as an employee, what to look for if you're gonna go into an organization, what type of culture should you be part of, how to take initiative if your manager doesn't, uh, multiple ways to grow your career competence and efficacy. Um, and then lastly, we spoke about what leadership is in terms of career growth, why we should be looking at leadership as a prism, what that means exactly, and how it can help you better understand how to support your team. So let's jump right into it. Uh, this is Julie Winkle Giuliani. She is a TEDx speaker. 2x best-selling author and evangelist of workplace growth and development. Oh, the origin story, you know, I've been a teacher, I think, since I came out of the womb. I just remember my first play dates were all about blackboards and books and showing people how to do stuff. And my mom, um, when she went to her first parent-teacher conference when I was in kindergarten, I, yeah, I'd gotten stars on all my papers, so she was expecting a great conversation. And she came back and she shared with me that I was doing very well academically, but that the teacher was afraid to leave the room because uh, she was afraid that I would take over the class and start uh, start teaching if she wasn't around. So in my, my uh, heart and soul, I think I was just uh, born to, to teach. And so it made sense that my first job was teaching. It was actually teaching modeling and charm to children. What, and is that? what does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> so you know, these little, you know, squeaks, their parents would bring them in and they'd want them to learn how to say please and thank you and ex ex yeah, demonstrate good manners. And we also threw a little modeling in there as well. They got to, to graduate with a fashion show. And I'm firmly convinced if you can teach five-year-olds manners, um, you know, that's a great platform for probably anything in life. Um, and so it moved on. My audience just grew up and I taught high school for several years. I was a college professor and department chair before going back into industry, but also in learning and development roles. I was training manager for a couple of different organizations before going to work for a commercial training company that built and delivered training worldwide to organizations. And so that's where I cut my 
consulting teeth, and that's where I learned this really weird niche skill around how to build a commercial training program, which is really different than building a program for one organization or one small audience. Building something that's going to work for any level, any industry, any country, it's a really, it's a different animal and a great skill set to have learned. So 20 years or so, I left that role, went out on my own and continued to do that kind of work. Uh, and I still do that kind of work. I love the instructional design training development puzzle. But uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I guess it's been now, one of my clients, Beverly Kay, invited me to co-author a book that turned out to be Help Them Grow or Watch Them Go. And at the time I said, sure, you know, it was kind of one of those bucket list items. Um, yeah. And how hard can it be, right? <laughs> I quickly <that>. discovered. <laughs> Um, but a thrilling opportunity, just a wonderful uh, chance to be able to step into a whole new, and yet not whole new, skill set. You know, it, it was playing off of my teaching and, and the writing work that I'd been doing. Uh, but help them grow my bucket list, let's do that because it'll be fun sort of project, turned out to be a real game changer. I had no anticipation for how big that book would, would become. It became a bestseller. It's been translated into seven languages. It was a bestseller in Russia. I, I ended up keynoting in Russia as a result of all of this. But the opportunity to really have an impact on managers and supervisors who were struggling with, you know, how do I have these career conversations with people? Uh, it's been just a joy for the last 10 years, sort of riding that wave. And that's what you know allowed me to do the the TEDx talk and and literally travel the world talking about career development, and it allowed me to keep learning more about career development as well. Really, the realities that people were up against, and the question that I asked everybody everywhere I went was, "What does career mean to you?" And it became sort of a, a field resource a research project. Anyway. Fast forward, um, a couple of years ago, ATD, the Association for Talent Development, which is one of the biggest learning and development uh, associations in the world, invited me to do some blog posts. And um, at the time, I was pretty busy and really had to think about, gosh, can I fit this in? But ATD is such a great organization. And gratefully, I did, because one of their editors read one of the posts and said, that could be a book. Would you be interested? And so that's how it's uh, it's come to pass that I have written uh, Promotions Are So Yesterday, Redefine Career Development, Help Employees Thrive. And it comes out on March 8th, 2022. So um, we're going to talk about that in a, in a bit. I want to go into a, f a few things that you experienced in your career and, and understand them. And maybe that can sort of frame why you moved from uh, training programs into career development. So as a, when you're creating these training programs and structuring them for organizations, what did you see was missing with all the employees across all these different, um, different industries, categories, uh, different geographies? Um, what was the, what was the thing that you saw that they were lacking in their career? Because obviously it was enough that it prompted you to sort of go down this rabbit hole of, I'm not just going to teach and, and, and sort of deploy these glo these global training programs, I'm going to help people understand how to better communicate and interact and engage with and support their employees. Yeah, yeah. So, so much of the work that I've done in instructional design is in the leadership space. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to really delve deeply into leaders, managers, supervisors, and what they're up against, which is extraordinary. You know, there was a time when managers only managed the performance of people. That was their job. And today there are very few managers who don't also have deliverables, projects, clients, and all the rest of the day-to-day -day work that employees have as well. And oh, by the way, make sure you fit in that most important, most critical responsibility around helping your people grow. And so what's been missing for a lot of organizations, a lot of leaders, a lot of employees is a manager's capacity to really meet people where they are 
in terms of delivering the support required for the growth that they want. You know, I did some research a couple years ago, pre-pandemic, uh, but I, I would stand by it today and asked employees about what their expectations were of managers. One of the top expectations that employees had across the generational continuum from Z's through boomers was that their managers have a fundamental responsibility to help them grow. And yet in organization after organization, when you look at the engagement surveys, the climate surveys, the, the exit interviews, one of the primary problems people have is that they're not getting the growth. And so the, the problem that the, the last book and this book, Promotions or So Yesterday, um, is designed to really address is how can we help managers who are overburdened have more to do than can ever get done in a given day? How can we give them the tools that make it easy for them to do job one, which is growing their people? Okay, that makes sense to me. So that so I understand the, the progression through through your career, oh, career excuse me. Now, um, the particular, I always find this interesting, the, the title of your book. So promotions are, are so yesterday. Why did you choose that title? What does that mean? And, and, and obviously, what does it mean to you? And why was it so important? But also, what does it mean in the context of the, the average person in an organization? Why would they not want to get promotions? Why is that a thing of the past? And thank you for asking, because the title really is intended to sort of get attention. It's intentionally you know, cheeky to, to, to yeah. grab the, the hearts and minds of uh, potential it's readers. It's very good. I like it. And I can't take credit for it. My publicist, Fazia Burke of FSB Associates, came up with it uh, just as kind of a throwaway line one day when we were trying to figure out what to call the book. And when she said it, both of our eyes just kind of got really big and it was like, that's the name of it. And the truth is, if my publisher would let me have you know, a billboard rather than these you know, few square inches, the title could have probably been something like, Promotions are so yesterday is the exclusive and default definition for how we define career success. You know, we could have gone on a little bit more, but the, the, the shorthand, Promotions are so yesterday, acknowledges the reality that we're up against today. When you look at today's organizations, they are lean, they're flat, Mid-levels of management have been, you know, de taken out of the, the org chart. Some positions, they're, they're going open longer. And now with so many organizations going remote and hybrid, even, you know, some of those geographic boundaries now that are down, I mean, there's more competition for roles within an organization. Okay. And yet, despite the fact that intellectually we all get that there are fewer, you know, the nature of, a, a, of an organization is a pyramid or a pinhead in some cases, but it gets narrower and narrower. And we understand that intellectually and that there's something in our hearts or in, in the gray matter somewhere that when we hear career and career development, it just hijacks the brain and takes us to that expectation that we're going to be invited up that corporate ladder. It's just this default setting that somehow you know, has, has slipped into our DNA. And it's a mathematical impossibility. At the end of the day, we can't give a promotion to everybody who wants development. And yet, because that's been sort of the only thing on the menu, the only way we've talked about what career development is for all these years, um, we're creating dissatisfaction for employees who aren't getting those promotions. And we're creating tremendous angst for managers and supervisors who know they don't have those promotions to give. And so then they're wary about, should I even have this conversation? I don't want to set expectations and tick people off and, and disengage them. So promotions are so yesterday as the only way that we're going to be defining career development going forward. And what my field research found was there are actually seven other dimensions of career development 
that are actually, they're more interesting to employees than that climb up the corporate ladder. It's just that we haven't had the language to talk about it or the, the additional items on the menu for folks to, uh, to order those up. Understood. And is that a recent phenomenon? Is this, um, because even before we were speaking and, and we pressed record, we were talking about what motivates and what drives people to move in certain directions for their career. So uh, what has the landscape changed in the past two years or is this a generational thing? So walk me through that. So the landscape's been changing, you know, right along. Um, and I would say the last two years have probably amplified some of the issues uh, that we have, have been grappling with. What I would say is this multidimensional career framework that I've developed speaks to engagement and it has elements that levers maybe is a better way to, to say it, levers that managers and, and leaders have probably been using throughout their careers. What's different about this is we can use these same levers or dimensions specifically for the purpose of development. So what happens is, for instance, one of the, the dimensions is contribution. What we know from the research is people want to, there's this human need to step up, to, to make a difference, to be of service, to do something, to live on purpose. And so managers, you know, for years have tapped that, used that lever, and helped people feel that sense of contribution. What I'm talking about in the book is let's keep doing that, but let's make it reciprocal. Let's turn it into development because the truth is when I step up and I do something more, when I decide I'm going to make a difference, I'm going to change this process, or I'm going to lead this project, or I'm going to problem solve for the customer, I'm making a contribution to the organization, but I also have tremendous opportunity to grow and learn through that. And when managers on the front end of that contribution, when managers can sit with an employee and say, what do you want to get out of this? What skills do you want to have developed? What visibility might you want to enjoy? What do you want to be able to do differently on the other side? Then it's at that point, I'm giving, but I'm also getting. And at that point, we've got a really rich reciprocal, you know, relationship there. And is that something that, so, so is when, when do you start to deploy this framework? So I'm a manager or I'm even a, an early stage startup founder and I want to, I want to hire talent, obviously. And I want that talent to, to, you know, work hard for my organization, uh, exceed all their KPIs. I want them to feel like they're, you know, they're welcome part of our culture. I want them to feel like they're growing because I know that if they feel like they're growing, they're going to be excited about working for the organization. So that's probably going to, you know, be to my benefit as well. Now, at what point do I start? Is it when I first onboard them, I'm setting these expectations about what career growth looks like? Or is it uh, like, I guess sort of practical tips for somebody that wants to sort of deploy this in their organization. When do they start working on it? Is it from day one? I would say it's from day zero. When okay. you're in the recruiting and interviewing process, that's the perfect time to start painting a picture of what growth, development, engagement, success looks like within your organization, to set a realistic set of expectations about what that candidate can expect when they join you. And so if you think about it, especially right now, candidates have so many choices. The competition for talent is fierce. So if you had a choice, if you were a candidate sitting with a manager who says, you know, we are really committed to development here in this organization. And certainly moves and promotions and positions, that's a piece of it. But where we focus in on is what's going to be most interesting to you. What kind of growth do you will you want at any given time? And so we've got this framework and we're going to talk to you about sometimes you're going to want to step up and learn through contribution. Other times it's going to be competence. Sometimes it's going to be connections, you know, building your network. And we're going to work with you to get that visibility, build that kind of a a community that you're looking for. 
There are going to be times when confidence is where we're going to want to work together and find ways jointly to help you really feel that sense of assuredness and that you've got this in your space. There are going to be times when it's going to be challenge or, or let's be honest, there are times when, you know, over the course of this career, you might have to back off a little bit and lean into contentment and ease and joy and balance. We might want to find ways to boost the choice, the autonomy, the flexibility that you have. We have all of these different avenues to go down during the course of your career with us. And we're going to work with you to make sure that you're growing every day you're here versus a candidate who's hearing from a manager. Yep. Okay. So you're coming in as manager and in a couple of years, you could probably get to a director level and by year five, maybe you're an AVP. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I'm going with manager number one. Yeah, so, no, my, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was going to say, I was going to say, um, I, I, I want to, I, I want to understand, um, because the other part of it is how do we, so I, I see where you're saying you want to go with manager one, but I want to understand, is it the candidate that we have to look for that looks for alternative, um, uh, development, uh, like these, like these seven development, uh, dimensions, because I know that there's also people that I've interviewed in the past that are like, I do want the title. I do want more money. So can I still hire that person and maybe set expectations? And I'm just sort of spitballing here, but maybe my expectations are I'm going to develop you so that you could actually go somewhere else where that is tangible, but I'm going to use you for these two years or something like that. And this is what I can offer you right now, but know that we're going to try and get you to where you want to go in your career and it won't be with us. Is that something that we could do for somebody that is driven by some maybe different levers? Absolutely. And there are folks for whom the climb up the corporate ladder is absolutely their goal. So the, that's a reality. I don't believe that at any point that's, that motivation will entirely go away. And it's probably the appropriate step for nearly all of us at different points in our career. The challenge with the climb up the corporate ladder is it's out of the control of the manager and the employee. You know, we have very little influence over that. Whereas the other seven dimensions are absolutely within the control of the manager and the supervisor. So in that scenario, absolutely, you have someone who has traditional ambitions to move up the corporate ladder. No reason to close the door on that person. But when you overlay the opportunity that beyond and between and besides those promotions, here are all the other ways we can help you grow. You're not going to be sitting on your hands, sitting in the waiting room, you know, in between those moves. You're actually going to be in the training room, in the classroom, day in and day out, developing the skills, the ability, the network, the confidence that you need. And we acknowledge, you know, maybe we're not going to be the place you're going to retire from. Uh, and that's okay. Because the truth is, I mean, as you well know, Scott, managers who do this well develop a reputation for development. Mm -hmm. They don't have any trouble backfilling talent. People are standing yeah. in line to work for someone like that. Now, at the same time, though, I also want to show the other side of, of the coin here. Because climb is absolutely important to some people at different points in their career. But when we, when I created the multidimensional career framework with these seven dimensions plus climb, we did some research with over 700 folks worldwide. And we just simply asked them with a, a quick line of definition for each of these, prioritize them, sequence them, rank order them from most important, you know, what's your most important, what's most interesting right now to you, how you want to grow right now, all the way down to the least interesting. And when the research came back in aggregate, all of those seven dimensions, contribution, competence, connection, confidence, challenge, contentment, and choice, all ranked higher than climb. Hmm. In aggregate, right. climb was at the bottom. Now, there was one group for whom climb wasn't. It was second to the bottom. It was the 20-somethings. We did it in 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on. For, um, for the 20-somethings, 
climb was second from the bottom and choice was dead last for them, which kind of makes sense, you know, as they newer entrants to the workforce may welcome more structures, they kind of get their legs under them. But in aggregate, contribution was first, competence was second, and, uh, and then, you know, it goes uh, from there, but climb was absolutely dead last. And so what's happening is so many managers are fearful, they've got this angst, or they avoid altogether the career conversation because they don't think they've got anything of value to offer people. They've got seven dimensions that in many cases are more valuable than the climb. So I'm a manager. I have a million and one things on my plate. And I'm sure that you figured out a way for me to to do this effectively while still doing everything else. Because I know that's the first thing that anybody is going to, you know, they're going to push back on. They're going to say, listen, like, I would love to. I would love to help this person network. I would love to help this person have more autonomy. I can barely keep track of what they're doing already. How am I just giving them new jobs, new roles, new responsibilities all the time? So what's the framework for actually doing this as a manager? Because I think everybody would want to do this. I don't think anybody's going to be like, no, I don't want to make people better. It's always a, it's always a matter of like prioritizing it and time and bandwidth, right? Yeah, no, you're, you've hit the nail on the head. You're right. I don't think any manager wakes up thinking, I think today I'll thwart my people and keep them small. <laughs> uh, it's in everybody's best interest for employees to grow. That goes without saying. And you're right. You know, when we did the research for the first book, Help Them Grow or Watch Them Go, um, we wanted to get to the bottom of, why managers weren't doing this, and time was number one, three to one, uh, any other issue. And you can't argue, managers are, are absolutely starved for time. And so, so the question is, how do we use the time that we already have with folks, perhaps a little differently? So we aren't gonna invent more time or add any more time to the day, but how can we redeploy the time that we've got? So first thing that we've done is we've created a self-assessment that employees can take that helps them understand their priorities. There's a, a copy of it, of course, in the book, uh, but we also have an online version of it. So managers can accelerate the conversation by inviting people to do this self-assessment. And even the act of self-assessing, even before they get their, their results, just the act of starting to consider these different dimensions and rank ordering some of these things, that becomes a huge aha for folks. So they go through that process, they get a personalized report emailed to them, and it, uh, it rank orders what their greatest uh, down to their least interesting dimensions are, defines this a little bit, goes into their top dimension or dimensions in some detail and gives them some reflection questions. So if a manager is committed to engaging with employees with this new framework, they can, with you know, simply a, an email to that employee, make this suggestion and be conversations ahead by the time they actually come together and then can look at, all right, where are, so there's no guesswork. It's very clear where are the interests here. And then what the book does is each of the chapters is one of these dimensions and it gives specific activities that you can engage in with the employee. Most of which are embedded right in the work. I use the expression transforming while performing. When we can double team it, when we can make real work be the development, then again, you're taking that time issue off the table. And so how can we embed, for instance, a new challenge that's really focused and aligned with somebody's growth goal? How can we embed that in their job? I mean, it becomes one of their KPIs, one of the goals on their performance review. It, it's not separate from over in this you know, corner here. It is the work becomes the development and the development then becomes the work. So those are just a couple of ways that we can start to address the legitimate time challenge managers have. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, if you want to organize your business, you need a CRM. If you actually want to grow your business, you need HubSpot CRM. With HubSpot, your sales, marketing, customer service, and ops teams will have access to all the same dynamically updated data. 
so they won't get their wires crossed on where a customer is in their journey or how to convert them. Plus, HubSpot CRM is easy to buy and easy to use, so you don't have to waste valuable time onboarding your teams or managing software, and you start seeing value right away. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better in 2023 and get a special offer of 20% off on eligible plans at HubSpot.com slash success pod. Can you give me, I know there's uh, obviously a few, but can you give me like one example of one of these, you sort of touched on it briefly, the fact that you'd build this into their KPIs and, and actually have this as an objective, but could you give me maybe uh, like a little bit more in depth of like one example of how you would actually do this with one employee based on one of the, one of the dimensions? Sure, absolutely. Man, we could do this all afternoon. This could be I know fun. we could do this all afternoon. We could go through everything, but then you still, you still have to go get the book to get the everything. <laughs> okay, thank you, Scott. I, I appreciate that. Um, so let's just take on one connection. And, um, you know, I, I, it's one of my favorite of the, the dimensions. And we've heard that expression, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And it's a little bit of an overstatement, but clearly... The, the relationships that we have have a profound effect on our career growth. And um, especially over this last couple of years, man, connection has become increasingly uh, important to people. So uh, so let's, let's suppose you have an employer manager, you have an employee for whom connection is a high priority. So the question is, what do you want to learn with whom through whom, in order to satisfy your need for connection while also growing. So what I hear from a lot of folks is, you know, they default to, okay, well, I'll make an introduction or mentoring or coaching. And, and those are all legitimate. They're in the book. They're, you know, strategies for doing that. But what frequently falls off a manager's radar screen is the opportunity to put people together strategically on teams, on projects, around initiatives that allow them to engage with others for strategic purposes, you know, really intentionally, deliberately pulling this team together toward real work that needs to get done. And the good news is, you know, there are plenty of voids and problems and issues in most organizations that you can bring people together around. But so frequently, you know, when you think about networking and just connecting, there's a lot of social anxiety. I know, you know after two years of being shut down, people don't feel quite like themselves anymore. Even making small talk for some folks is, is challenging. And if you're an introvert on top of that, just free form networking, that's not going to be a meaningful way to connect. But you start putting people shoulder to shoulder working together when you give them the excuse to be together and doing something of, of value to the organization, then that discomfort falls away. You've got something to talk about. You've got something in common and you're able to make a very you know meaningful connection. When I look back on projects and initiatives with others, those are some of the strongest relationships that I have and people in my I network my network that I know I can really count on. So that's one way, you know, real meaningful work, strategically bringing people together around uh, work that needs to get done that handles the connection piece of it that leads to the growth, but that also, Scott, goes back to the challenge that we talked about a moment ago. It's time. This isn't extra and above. It's embedded right in there. And that project, successful completion of that project is something they're also evaluated on. So you're able to, to get the real work done, you're able to get the development done, and you're able to evaluate and support both. One of the things that you've brought up in past conversations is that to be a leader, you should be a prism. And I want to understand what that means because I thought that was an interesting point and I had no idea what it meant. So obviously, <laughs> obviously it's, a, it's a topic that you've spoken on before. So what does that mean in the context of career growth, support, your, support for your employees? I really like light. <laughs> Um, there is something is it an magical about light. Yeah. yeah. Well, and in okay. fact, you know, I've got blackout uh, curtains on the windows because if I didn't, we'd have we don't have even you know window treatments. That's how much I like light in here. Um, and as a leader, I just really can envision that my job is to take this beautiful light that comes through 
your folks, each of your uh, individual uh, employees. And if I can position myself in the right way to support them the right way, what comes out on the other side is this beautiful rainbow of possibilities and skills and contributions and talents and superpowers that you couldn't see, that they couldn't see coming in. It was just white there coming in. But if I can get myself positioned at just that right angle for them, suddenly it breaks out and you can see the richness of who they are and they can see the richness of who they are. And the prism also really works for this multi-dimensional career framework too. Because traditionally, we have, have looked at career development in this one-dimensional, either up the corporate ladder or sometimes two-dimensional, the climbing wall and the jungle gyms and the lattices and stuff that have the lateral thing. But I'm almost saying, let's put the prism on the side of career. And as the light goes through, it breaks career out into these other dimensions of contribution and choice and, and whatnot. Um, it, it feels to me like as leaders, when we're really intentional, when we understand who that person is, when we really see and experience them as a whole, when we invest in them holistically, we can position ourselves to help them see the breadth, the depth, the possibilities that may not be um, obvious initially. I love that. That actually is a very good analogy. I'm glad I asked that. It's it's a great analogy. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and let's let's flip the script a little bit and let's look at from the perspective of the employee or the person going into an organization. What should they look for? What are the cultures that usually tend to foster development and and the people that you'd want to work with? You know, if I were looking for a job today and sitting down across the table from a prospective hiring manager, I would ask them to tell me a little bit about the people who have left their organization, what they're doing, where they are, how that went. That speaks volumes, to be honest with you. Um, I was talking to, it's been a little bit ago, um, managing director of a financial services firm and just a, a marvelous director of or a developer of people and he would take talent and just bring out the best stuff in them skill them up and his organization wasn't able to compensate them well enough and so they were being picked off by competitors mm -hmm. and as we were talking he was still so upbeat and positive about the whole situation. And I finally just had to say, John, help me understand this. You know, you are hemorrhaging talent. You're doing everything you can to grow them. And they're just leaving by the droves. Help me understand why you're smiling as you're having this conversation with me. And he told me about a situation where Someone who he had grown, gone to a competitor, obviously very disappointed about the whole thing. But they together had just to, uh, collaborated on a piece of business, the largest piece of business his company had ever been able to secure. He said, I could have never done that with just anyone. I could trust him. He had my back. I had his back. I know he was loyal to me. I knew his skill level. And we could do something together, even though he wasn't in our organization any longer. And I thought, gosh, what an abundant mindset to bring to talent. But it also was just this perfect, you know, like karmic circle that he did the right thing and the right thing came back to him. So I would love, I think, uh, evidence of a, a development culture is how people talk about those who've left. Uh, I, I, that speaks volumes uh, uh, about how we approach development and the generosity, you know, sort of back to the, the point that you made earlier, I might only have you for two years and that's okay. Let's make this a great two years where you're contributing to us, but where we're making a difference to you as well. And I think that, you know, you've you've mentioned that you've pulled out a few data points and you've done a few studies. Uh, can you paint a picture of the reality of the current, I think you've touched on this, but just to sort of double down on it, the reality of the current job market, why it's so important to even care about this in terms of how fast employees switch jobs or what employees are looking for 
everything that has, like you mentioned, is sort of fast forwarded through COVID. Um, what does the average employee do? Do they stay for a year? Do they stay for two? Do they, if you don't focus on these things, how fast do they move to the next job? Obviously, everything's virtual now, so it's very easy to switch jobs. Um, so do you have any data points or just some thoughts on, on the, re the current reality we're living through? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We could run through numbers from now till doomsday. So <laughs> uh, the latest numbers I'm familiar with, um, we will have an average of 12 jobs over the course of our year, our careers. Average tenure is down to four years, but that's variable based upon level, industry, and that kind of thing. Career development continues to be one of the primary reasons people join a job, stay at a job, you know, leave a job. LinkedIn did a survey, I want to make sure I get the number right, 94% of employees said they would stay longer in an organization if they felt like the organization was investing in their development. But the statistic that is just blowing me away these days, um, employees who don't perceive growth opportunities are almost eight times as eager to leave, even if they like their jobs. So someone wow. who is satisfied in their job, it's not like they don't like what they're doing, but if they don't feel like they've got growth opportunities, eight, almost eight times as, as eager to leave and find something else. So from my perspective, you know, as we look at the great resignation, reshuffle, reevaluation, whatever you want to call it, lots of reasons for that. But one of the levers that managers have completely in their control is the ability to offer people opportunities for growth. And if we can paint a, a, a possibility filled future, uh, a picture where opportunities for growth live, I think we have the opportunities managers to keep folks longer and also to attract the kind of talent that we need. Yeah, no, that's very, that, those are incredible stats. I, I I didn't know you had them handy, but that's really good. That's, that's, that really paints a picture. I had no idea. Like I had, I had some idea, but when you go into the numbers, it's, it's very, it's very obvious that people have to get, get you know, uh, pardon my French, like get their shit together when it comes to providing the proper culture for people. Because I think that if you're lazy and you don't focus on these other, other dimensions and these other levers to help people grow, I think. Uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult for you to secure talent, for you to keep talent. It's going to be like there's there's like <laughs> there's financial reasons why this is going to be a necessity at one point. Um, That's a, it's a really be, good yeah. point. That's a really good point, Scott. There is a business case for doing this. You know, we used Very to think about so. career development as the soft, squishy stuff, um, but this is hard, bottom line stuff. And again. Even the best developers of people, you're going to lose talent. Stuff happens. People are going to shift and move and interests are going to change and whatnot. But if a manager or a leader builds people development, career development as a core competency, they don't have to fear the loss of talent because they've got the, the ability to bring that next person in and up to speed um, very quickly and effectively. Very good. Okay. Um, I want to, I want to pivot into some rapid fire, just to pull some last minute insights out of you before we pivot. Um, what closing thoughts on, on your work, what, what do you hope to accomplish over your life? What would be the ideal outcome? Mm -hmm. If somebody was to look back at your, your body of work, what, what impression do you want to leave on the world? What impact do you want to leave on the world? Wow. That's deep, Scott. <laughs> it is. Well, you're doing you're doing this for a reason. So, what is what is where do you where do you hope to see your work impacting the future of work, the future of progress, the future of of personal professional development? Because you're doing it for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, if people said what she did made my job easier and more joyful, made it easier for me to help people grow, and it made it more joyful because I really saw that. Um, the development was happening and I saw people reach their potential. People said that about me. I would feel like that was a life fairly well lived on the work front. Very good. Very good. Um, where do people go get the book? And then uh, also more, also as just as important, where do people connect with you on social, all the websites, all of that? 
Probably the easiest place to find me is my website, juliewinklegiulioni.com, and I'm sure you'll put that in the, the show notes. Yes. A lot yes. of letters there. <laughs> and um, at that site, you can learn anything that you need. You can learn about the book. You can also take that self-assessment that I, I mentioned. Um, and the book, Promotions Are So Yesterday, Redefine Career Development, Help Employees Thrive, that's published by ATD Press, is available for pre-order now, and it launches on March 8. It's available on Amazon and all your fine booksellers. Perfect. Is there any socials? Uh, your your oh, best I'm social on, is it? Yep, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. All same name? Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, okay, let's do a couple rapid fire. Uh, the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome in your personal or professional life, what was it? How'd you overcome it? What'd you learn from it? Biggest challenge I don't think I've overcome. Um, I still struggle with it and it's balance. You know, it's, it's finding that balance. Um, and you probably share it too. When you are an entrepreneur, when you're doing your own work and you love what you're doing, it is so easy to just become consumed by it and forget, you know, even with family and friends and everything to forget that. So I am in a constant tension between, you know, not trying, trying to, to throw myself into my work and thoroughly enjoy that while also making sure that I've got the, the ease and the rest and the rejuvenation and the, the, other kind of fun time as well. So that's, I, I think that might be life's challenge for me this time around. A hundred percent. That That is a challenge of everyone who's passionate about anything for sure. Yeah. And it is a constant struggle, but that's a good challenge. It's a good problem to have. It means you're in the, it's, you know, you're in your yes. zone of genius or whatever, whatever you call it. Um, you're doing something you love and you're passionate about. Um, if you had to choose one person, obviously there's been many people, but one person who's had an incredible impact on your life, who was that? What did they teach you? I've been blessed with so many great role models. Um, and it's probably cliche, but I'm, I'm going to go with my dad. My dad was this amazing man. He had an eighth grade education. He had to drop out of school when he was in eighth grade to support his family. And he ended up being a printer, uh, and when he and my mom got together and they had family and we were starting to go to school, my brother and I, they wanted something more for us than they had had. And uh, a printer's salary doesn't go very far. And so my dad made the commitment. He basically took a second job. My dad worked two jobs most of the time I was growing up. He was gone before I woke up in the morning um, and, and not home till after I was in bed. And it was the most extraordinary and generous act. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, of course. You know, kids take that for granted. But in retrospect, the most generous um, act of love for his family. But he was also an incredible role model for work ethic. Um, and so not a day goes by that I don't reflect upon that and really aspire to honor the work ethic that he brought to our family and, and the gifts that he gave to me as a result. While at the same time, you know, he, he also is a reminder of that balance that I do want to strike, that I don't want that to be the, the way my days are lived and the way my, um, my life is lived. Very good. If you had a, a favorite source to learn and grow, a book, a podcast, an audible, something that's impacted you, um, what was that? So people can go check it out. Oh gosh, yeah, I, I, we've got a whole library to go through. Right now, what I am really appreciating is Whitney Johnson's new book, Smart Growth, really good. Um, and it just, it speaks to the nature of learning and lays out a, a roadmap that I think is helpful for anyone at any phase in their career, learning anything in general. If you could tell uh, your 20 year old self one thing, what would it be? <laughs> chill out mellow Just out relax. yeah yeah i mean stop worrying about everything half the things you're worrying about aren't going to happen just you know let it go it's going to be okay and then last question what does success mean to you choice choice control autonomy flexibility volition being able to decide who i get to work with when i work how i work 
just the, the experience of, of having choice uh, in my life is success.